Good afternoon. I'm Fred 1.0. <laughs> I was a nerdy, academically oriented, chubby little sixth grader, grew up in a very loving, working class home, and was very excited the day that my teacher told me about this opportunity to test for Hunter College High School. Didn't quite know what it was, but I knew it was going to be an environment that was probably a better fit to what I thought I was about at the time. And so I remember going home and getting the books and studying and studying and preparing for that test, and I walked in on test day, and I knew nothing. All the words seemed like they were in a foreign language, and I hadn't studied any foreign languages at that point. And so I expected to get a zero, and I spent the next two months trying to prepare to brace my parents for the fact that I had failed this exam. So I was shocked when my principal called me into his office and said, congratulations, you made it into Hunter. What a great moment for me. But at the same time, now the dog had caught the car. What was I going to do now? <laughs> and I remember walking in to my official class, and I just felt like I was out of my environment. I felt uncomfortable. I remember looking around that room, and there was one other black male face in the room. And uh, it was a friend of mine, long time now, Terrence Colton. I looked at him and said, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> and so we started our conversation. And from that moment, ah, I relaxed. I could just be a Hunter student at that point. And I've spoken to Terrence about this many times over the years. And he said to me he had the very same reaction when he walked into that room. And so I became a Hunter student. And what a great thing it was to be a Hunter student. I was part of one of the most amazing communities I've ever known, the smartest people I've met to this day, a caring, close-knit community. And I was part of an environment that had high expectations for me that I needed to meet. And that's an important thing in your formative years, right? Things can go wrong pretty quickly. But when people expect you to do well, you begin to expect that yourself. And so I had a terrific experience at Hunter. And it, provided a great foundation for me as I went on to college and then to law school and then the practice of law. And I think it was the strength and courage that I got from the foundation I had at Hunter that allowed me to say, you know what, this law thing is not for me. And so I wound up in the field of education and have been privileged to work in education for the past 14 years. It's been a great run. And so I have to say, things are pretty good. Fred 1.0. <laughs> I'm here today talking to you because while Fred 1.0 is fine, the future for Fred 2.0 is looking ever bleaker. And so I want you to consider some tough issues today. I want you to consider whether or not the school system that we have is effective, equitable, and sustainable. And does that matter to you? And I want you to consider also how the system evolved the way it did and why it did. And finally, I want you to think, if you've decided, having considered the first several questions, if you've decided that, yes, change needs to happen, that you're willing to commit yourself to the change that needs to happen, whether it's incremental or whether it's dramatic, systemic change. Please commit yourself to that if that's what we need. And I want to talk to you about education. And I want to start with access. Access to me is a very meaty term. Because it means, of course, that you have an opportunity to be here. You can go here. But it means a lot more than that to me, having worked in the field over the past many years. And what I mean by that is, just being in the room isn't enough. Access to me means providing the tools that an individual needs in order to achieve success. And for students, a lot of that comes down to training, right? Academic training in part, but it's making that social adjustment if you're in a different environment. There are a lot of adjustments that the young people have to make in different environments. And they need to have the, the training that they need in order to do that. 
The second thing is information. And what I mean by that is that in any community, there's a lot of nuance. You know, the new person's not going to get it. There's a language. And if you're not familiar with it, you can get lost pretty quickly. And when you get lost, you lose out on opportunities that you might otherwise be able to take advantage of. And that is a shame. And the final thing is support system. I feel like that's so important. For me, having that conversation with, with Terrence Coulter was the first evidence, and thankfully, very thankfully, not the last evidence, that I received that I had a support system at this school that was going to make sure that I was going to be successful. I want to talk about what's become a really interesting hot button issue, which is, which is the uh, achievement gap and its role in access. And we know, of course, that test scores have, uh, have changed over the years. The good news is all test scores have improved. The bad news is the gap continues to grow. And we know that wealthier students are, out, are outperforming poor students on tests of achievement. What's interesting to me is that the gap between wealthy students and poor students is growing at about the same rate as the gap between wealthy students and middle class students, which is a frightening proposition for most of the rest of the American population. And it's something to consider as we ponder the idea of access, right? What does it mean to have this opportunity? And how likely are you to be able to gain access to these opportunities? It's a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong, it's a wonderful thing that the wealthy among us are able to marshal the resources they have at their disposal to create great educational outcomes for their, for their kids. The challenge is making sure that those without the same means are able to access opportunities that will not leave them behind as well. But the future looks bleak in that regard. And so when I think about that chubby sixth grader right now, Fred 2.0, who could do all the right things. He could study hard, be a straight A student, qualify to take the Hunter test, and he's going to go into that test. And in that room is going to be the student who has a $400 an hour tutor, and the student who took a review class that might have cost several thousand dollars, or the student who's traveled the world, and so understand some of the questions firsthand because of the range of experiences they've had. And so Fred 2.0 is at a real deficit, and it's unlikely that he's going to be admitted. And then, of course, what's the likelihood that if Fred 2.0 bucks the odds, that he's going to look across that classroom and see Terrence 2.0 as his classmate? Very, very small. Those odds are small. And we see this in many different realms, in K-12 education and increasingly in undergraduate and graduate education. So, you know, you know the cycle, right? You do well in school, you get to, get to a great college, you get a good education there and you make contacts and you go on out into the world, get a lucrative job, acquire wealth, move your family into a uh, good neighborhood with good schools into a good school district, right? Got to find a good school district for your kids. And then the cycle continues. They go to good schools, they get into great, school, great colleges, and so on and so on and so on. And what I'm seeing suggests that that's not a cycle that's repeatable for most of America right now and will continue to get less so over the next generation or two. And I want to illustrate what I'm talking about by sharing an anecdote about a couple. I call them Brenda and Eddie. Oh, some people got that. <laughs> so you know that Brenda and Eddie were the popular studies in the king and the queen of the prom, right? So Brenda and Eddie get married in 1975, summer of 75. And the story doesn't play out the way it does in the song that you may remember. Because Brenda and Eddie have graduated from college. They graduated from City College. No debt. And they start their lives 
and they decide that the best way forward for this couple is for Eddie to go to law school. Brenda takes a second job to pay for Eddie to go to law school. Law school tuition in 1976, less than $4,000 a year. So Brenda's able to pay for Eddie to go to law school. Right? Eddie does well in law school, graduates, and went to an Ivy League school. So he's got a pedigree. And the jobs open up for him, tons of them. He gets a job at a large white shoe firm on Wall Street, earning $45,000 a year. It's a ton of money back then. Eddie's doing well. Brenda's happy. The couple moves into a lovely apartment on the Upper West Side because they're planning to have kids and they want to be in a good school district so they can educate their kids properly. And they go on and they have kids. They have a son and a daughter. And Eddie's doing well enough financially at the firm that Brenda can stay home with the kids until they, they get to kindergarten. And she does so. Things are great. After the kids go to kindergarten, Brenda gets her teaching certificate and becomes a teacher. Eddie, on partnership track, just misses making partner and decides, you know what? This is the time. We've built up a little bit of a nest egg. The kids are doing well in their schools. And I'm going to put out my own shingle. And I'm going to do things that I'm passionate about. Brenda's got a job. Eddie's out on his own. Firm does well. Kids are doing well in school. And they continue to do well. And it turns out that their young son gets into Stuyvesant. And their daughter, at the same time, two years younger, gets into Hunter. Great. No worries about school, right? So they're good. And everything's great. They get to college. Things are pretty good at the firm. Oh, sigh of relief. The kids get into good, expensive schools. And, the, and Brendan and A say, we can pay for that. And they end up paying for the, their kids to go to college, $300,000. Ooh, good thing they had a nest egg, right? So they spend that money. Their son graduates. He gets a job at a tech startup, 2004. And the daughter goes off to law school. She's going to take over the family business. And things are, are great. 2008, market crashes. Son has to give up his trendy apartment in Williamsburg, moves back home. <laughs> living off the fat of mom and dad. And daughter happens to be a second year when the re Great Recession happens. And so the job market dries up. And it's a good thing that she decided to take that job with, with, uh, with Eddie's firm, which happens to be doing well enough to employ her. Things are pretty good. The family starts to pick up the pace here. Doing th things are, doing, are going pretty well. The one thing, of course, is that having spent $300,000 on that, that college education, things were a little tight. So mom and dad couldn't quite cover law school. And so now their daughter is in six figures of debt, over $100,000 in debt. But that's OK. She's got a stable job. She finds the love of her life and gets married. Mom and dad dip into the 401 k and help out, help pay, to pay for the wedding. And then, and then, she gets pregnant. Wonderful, isn't it? Her husband, who got a master's in education and is now $80,000 in debt, so the couple themselves, about $200,000 in debt, but they desperately need to move into a good area with a good school district, in a good school district with good schools. Mom and dad to the rescue. Right? They dip further into that retirement fund. They come up with a down payment. And since this couple is at $200,000 in debt, perhaps they co-sign for a loan as well. And so here we are with Brenda and Eddie and their kids. And let's look at the structural differences in where they are, 1976 or 1979 to 2011 or so. Brenda and Eddie, when Eddie graduates from law school, zero debt. Their daughter graduates, six figures of debt. Fortunately, she has a family that's able to provide some support for her. But her road's going to be a little bit tougher than, than theirs was, isn't it? She's got a little bit more to deal with here. And perhaps things will play out well for them. Perhaps they won't. But what I, I say that to illustrate to you the challenges now generationally for us as achieve, the achievement gap widens and access to opportunities becomes uh, a bigger deal for those 
on the lower 99% because college is more expensive and you really have to make decisions as to whether or not you want to take that, that opportunity at a, at a great school. And so I want to, I want to look at the change in, in the cost by illustrating the law school, the law school cost. $4,000 a year for Eddie in 1976. Law school today costs $60,000 a year, 15 times what it cost back then. And in case you're wondering, salaries at those large law firms have gone about four and a half times since then, right, for first year associates. So not matching, not matching what we're seeing um, in terms of costs. So now, if 1976, if you had told someone that it would cost 15 times as much to go to law school today as it did back then, they would have said you're crazy. But what if I told you that in 2054, it might cost $900,000 to go to law school per year? $2.7 million. How many people can come up with that? And so for those of you thinking, well, you know, I'll do whatever it takes for my kid, that might work. But then again, it might not. And what's interesting is when we look at, at our K-12 schools and how they're funded, the gap is tremendous, right? Our, our, our public schools are funded largely, as you know, it's decentralized, they're funded by property taxes to a large extent. The federal government pays about 3%. We spent about $600 billion on education a few years ago, according to a Times article. 24 billion of that came from the federal government. And the rest of it from localities, state, um, but a lot, much of it from property taxes. Now, if we look at the inequity in the terms of how much goes to the top versus the bottom, you're talking about in the wealthiest 10% of school districts, about $1.9 million per student is what the property is worth. In the poorest 10% of those districts, about $287,000. So much more money per student, just based on the way we fund our schools, is going to wealthier students. And of course, those in the middle get less than those at the top, but more, more than those at the bottom. The other thing to consider is that property taxes, as many of you know, are deductible on your federal taxes. And in the same year that the federal government spent $24 billion on education, $27 billion was deductible from property taxes. And of that amount, 20%, 22%, about $5 billion went to the richest 1%. The next 19%, added on about $15 million. So a little over $20 billion of 27 goes to the top 20%. The bottom 20%, zero. Big difference, right? So what we're looking at now is the challenge of students who are starting in K-12, who are behind because they have access to fewer resources, and even if they're able to buck the odds and get into uh, good schools and access great opp opportunities, at least what look on their face to be great opportunities, they don't necessarily have the tools and the resources to compete in those arenas, right? Can't pay for tutors, can't pay for test prep. And then if they buck all those odds and get to college, they're at the mercy of financial aid, right? Because they certainly can't pay what it costs to go to college these days. And that's what Fred 2.0 is facing, but it's what each of you is facing. And so for those who are saying, well, I'll get a second job, I'll go into my 401k, I'll work overtime, that may work for now, it may work for a generation, it may work for you and for you and for you, and then what happens in the next generation when it only works for you and for you? And what happens the next generation when it only works for you? And then where are we? Thank you. <laughs>